enter to your gates with thanksgiving. I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. To your courts with praise. I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. 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 Into your courts with praise. But I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Into your courts with praise. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Into your courts with praise. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. Courts with praise, but I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Into your courts with praise, oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Into your courts with praise, oh, I am. Into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. Oh, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with Jesus, 
Oh, there is none like you, Lord Jesus. Oh, there is none like you, Lord Jesus. Continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, Lord. oh your praise will continually be on my lips. Continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, Lord, your praise will continually be on my lips. Oh, your praise will continually be on my lips.
Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus, sovereign supreme. Oh, Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus, my sovereign supreme. Oh, Jesus. My Savior forever, oh, Jesus, oh, sovereign supreme, oh, Jesus, my King forever, oh, Jesus, my sovereign supreme, oh, Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus, my sovereign supreme. Oh, Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus, my sovereign supreme. Lord Jesus, my King forever. Oh, Jesus. My sovereign supreme, oh Jesus, my King forever, oh Jesus, my sovereign.
nothing like living in glory, oh Lord. Nothing like walking in Him. Nothing like moving with the wind of the Holy Ghost. Nothing like flowing with the rivers of God. Nothing like moving with the winds of the Holy Ghost. Nothing like flowing with the flowing of God. Flowing in the Holy Ghost. Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. Father, thank you for that mighty name. Vested with every power and authority. Holy Spirit, thank you for your mighty presence. For the glory of the Lord. As the water covers the sea. For the glory of the Lord that right now covers me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing like moving with the wind of the Holy Ghost. Nothing like flowing with the rivers of God. Hey. Nothing like living in the glory of Jesus Christ. Our King, our Savior, our Lord, our forevermore. Hallelujah. Lord, heal us and we shall be healed. Save us and we shall be saved. For you, Lord, O oh Lord, our, our praise. <laughs> and Father, you did. You saved us and we are saved. You healed us. And we are healed. And forever, oh God, you are our praise.
Rahaso, Miatara Masse, Hallelujah <laughs> to the Lord, Hallelujah. Almighty oh, God, oh God, you are God Almighty, our shield and our exceeding great reward. The one who sees us, the Lord, our provider, the judge of all the earth. You are God the most high who possesses heaven and earth. You are God almighty who peered to Jacob and loosed and blessed him. You are the God of Bethel. You are the everlasting God. You are I am that I am who revealed your name to Moses as Yahweh, the one who is merciful, gracious, long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Yahweh is your name forever. You are Lord, my banner. You are the Lord, our healer. You are the Lord who sanctifies us. Your name is wonderful. <laughs> Yahweh, peace. You are the rock of our salvation. Your name alone is Yahweh, the most high over all the earth. You are a consuming fire, a jealous God, a fire devours before you, a tempest is round about you. <laughs> You are the Lord of hosts enthroned above the cherubim. You are God, you alone have made the heavens and the earth. You are from everlasting to everlasting Lord. You are God of gods. You are Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a fearful one. You ride upon heavens. You, you are extolled upon your name, y'all. Your name is great and fearful for it is holy. Holy is your name. You are the Lord, our maker. You are the one who heals all our diseases, forgives all of our iniquities. You are the Lord, our shepherd. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with your glory. <laughs> Woo! You are the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Israel. The one who answers by fire. In you, Lord, is everlasting strength. You measured the waters in the hollow of your hand. You marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed out the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance. You sit above the circle of the earth. You stretch out the heavens like a curtain. You spread them like a tent to dwell in. You bring princes to nothing. You make the rulers of the earth as emptiness. You, Lord, bring forth the host by number. You call them all by their names. By the greatest of your might, and because of your strong, you are strong in power, not one of them is missing. Lord, you are the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. You do not faint. You do not grow weary. Your understanding is unsearchable. You give power to the faint. And to him who has no might, you increase in strength. <laughs> Before you, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after you. You, you alone are the Lord, and beside you there is no Savior. You are the Lord of hosts. You are the first, and you are the last. Beside you there is no God. Who is like you, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that has not yet been done? And yet, you're the one alone who brings them to pass. You have purposed and you will do it. You are our Redeemer. The Lord of hosts is your name. The Holy One of Israel. You are the first. You are the last. Your hand laid the foundation of the earth. Your right hand spread out the heavens. When you call to them, they all stand up together. <laughs> you are the Lord our God who teaches us to profit, who leads us in the way we should go. Our Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Lord, your salvation is forever. Your righteousness will never be diminished. You are the High and the Lofty One. You inhabit eternity, whose name alone is holy. You dwell in the High and the Lofty Place. You dwell in the High and the Holy Place. You are high and lifted up. Heaven is your throne. The earth is your footstool. You are the Lord, our righteousness. You, the Lord, you alone, you are the true God. You are the living God, the everlasting King. You, Lord, you made the heaven by your power. You established the world by your wisdom. And by your understanding, 
you stretched out the heavens. Behold, you are the Lord, the God of all flesh, and nothing is too hard for you. <laughs> you are the true God, the living God, and the everlasting King. You are the Most High that rules in the kingdom of men. And give it to, you give it to whomever you will. You are the Ancient of Days whose garment was white as snow, to whomsoever, forgive me, <laughs> whose garment is white as snow, the hair of your head is like pure wool. Your throne was like a fiery flame, and from the wheels the burning fire. A fiery stream issues and comes forth from before you. Thousands upon thousands minister unto you. Ten thousands times ten thousands stand before you. And your dominion is for everlasting. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I found a long time ago that there's nothing better to say than what's already been said. And not in the... Not in the the uh, framework of what men have said but what God has said what men say changes every month if they're the brightest of men if they're the wisest of men there's constantly a new edition coming out there's constantly a new revision of the hypothesis a new revision of the theory <laughs> A more complete understanding of how it might be that God's word is forever settled in heaven. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about it is God's word is forever settled in earth, for the word was made flesh and came dwelt among us, and we beheld the eternal glory that no man was able to look upon or see. But suddenly the fullness of the manifestation of the glorious person of almighty God the image bearer came and he declared unto us the fullness of God the fullness of truth the fullness of grace and now he's come live on the inside of us hallelujah you know people can have all the religion and all the ideas and all the concepts they want I'm taking Jesus I'm taking his manifest presence you know, sometimes we've just had to wrestle with people. We wrestle with them to try to take that religious, stinking little religious toy out of their hands so that the glory of God may come and invade their life. And for this reason, we suffer much persecution. <laughs> and for this reason, people are set and oppose themselves to us. But you know what? We're not going to stop doing it because the best thing that can happen to you is the religious ideologies that you have gotten from Christian, tr Christian tradition be removed out of your life and displaced from your life so that God can come move in. Amen. It's good to be back in the abiding place. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can be seated. Some of my heroes are here today from Overland's mission. Hey, so you guys stand and wave at everybody because listen, if anybody wants to go to the mission field, that's where you go, right there. You either go with us or you go with them, okay? So yeah, we're just so blessed to have you guys with us this morning. And if you don't know about Overland Submission, it's, uh, it's really, the Lord started it pretty much in Africa with Dill Smithers. Most of you would know. There's maybe a couple of visitors here. And doing probably some of the greatest things that have been done in modern day missions. It's the beginning of it and it's already big and wonderful. And we were with them, in fact, just this past, uh, I think it was May, and there, there was the chiefs of Zambia were there, the emperor of the Congo. I mean, that just kind of just testifies a little small token. And I, I think, Michelle, I think you just come from Cambodia, right? Yeah, both of you just been Cambodia. So it stretches out, you know, from, uh, and you're, are you leading up the team in Angola? Oh, you're Congo too. Praise God. That is awesome. Are you guys going to be here tonight? Or do you have to leave? Maybe if you are, if you guys are around, I'll have you share a little bit about Congo because I know Jake is going to be here. 
And we're looking forward to that. He's going to be, I think, in February. But praise God. If you're not busy in the kingdom, get busy. There's lots of work to do. Hey, somebody's saying, well, the Lord use me. No, he'll wear you out. Look at me. He'll wear you out. <laughs> hey, listen, the reality of it is, is it's not like God is picky or anything. You know, we, the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a human resource issue. And you know, I believe with all of my heart today, more than ever before, Father's done with having a bunch of religious people go. And so that's why there's been a decline in missions. He's just done with religious people going. And so he just, he basically stop and stop it. And people don't know why they've stopped it or they, why there's been a decline or a loss of interest. But reality of it is, his father wants to send people just like he sent his only begotten son. He don't want to send any other kind of people. And oh, you know, sometimes we look at this thing and we go, wow, it's too big for me. Hey, Eureka, moment of insight, discovery. Yeah, it is. Father wants you and I to learn how to totally trust on him, to do it his way, and to stand there and just proclaim his word and not try to take any of the blame, not try to take any of the credit. Whatever happens, he does it. He did it. And if we're willing to go with him, if we're willing to go for Father, the way he sent Jesus, he, people want to follow a different model. It's, uh, I, I, I watch people lost in the forest of ideology and I don't even want to say theology because they don't know the Bible well enough to have theological basis for what they believe it's just ideological and they're just lost in the forest and there really no need to be because the inside of the nation is shining bright the beacons upon the hill the highest hill ever and it's Christ Jesus and he's showing us this is what it looks like this is how you know when Jesus is standing there and he's seeing the multitudes before him and he's healing all that are sick and diseased and he sees them as sheep having no shepherd. It was in that context as the people are so hungry, so desperate. Father, on one side, we were so hungry, so desperate, so needy, so in pain, so in sickness, so in torment, so in disease. And on the other side, his father so, so desperate, so passionate about touching them and healing them and meeting all their needs. And Jesus looks over the landscape of all of this that's going on and he says, the harvest is plenteous. And the laborers of you. Pray therefore that the Father, the Lord of the harvest, will send forth laborers. And he wasn't talking about unique, different kind of laborers, laborers based upon whatever our doctrinal beliefs are. Do you know there's many denominations? How many of you know that? Did you know that every denomination absolutely is right? Did you know that no denomination out there is saying the other denomination is more right than we are actually? No, they are just like they got it. And then those who really, you know, are really honest, and I've, I've been blessed to be around a number of different theologians and denominations that, like one of my, one of my favorite guys I like to mention is Dr. Carver, who was one of the translators of the NIV. One day I was talking to Dr. Carver, and I said, yeah, but Dr. Carver, you know that what you're saying is not biblical. And he says... You're right, but it is our experience. I said, but is that justifiable? Shouldn't the word define our experience rather than our experience define the word? He says, that's not what we accept. You have to choose as to what you accept. At least some people are honest about it, you know. Other people want to try to camouflage it and they want to have a smoke screen as though they really got it all put together. You know, I'm going to tell you who's got it all put together. You ready? Holy Ghost. Yeah. And you know what he's done? He's come to reveal Jesus. And wherever you see Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now, you're seeing truth. All the rest of it, suspect. Huh? And I say suspect rather than say it's lie or false. Because I know that there are people who are genuinely pursuing, seeking God. They really want to know God. It's just that there's no revelation of Jesus there yet. Huh? They're what they're saying, their pursuit is after God, but... The revelation of Jesus just has it is waning in their life. Why? Well, they didn't know how to yield to the Holy Ghost. Maybe they just maybe the Word of God, the Word of Truth, is just too big for them to be able to say, "Here it is for me to live as Christ." Maybe that's just too big for people. They want to one day get there. One day I want to be able to say, "For me to live as Christ," then you're never going to be it, because miracle only happens by way of agreement with what God said in His Word. You don't agree with, if the blind man doesn't agree with God's word, he's going to be 
eternally, well, he's going to be as long as he lives, clearly blind and more than likely eternally blind. If the crippled man doesn't believe what the Lord doesn't agree with what God says, it doesn't believe that the word is going to heal them, they're forever crippled, sick, diseased. Same with salvation. Same with being made a new creation. You might go and look in the mirror and you look like the same guy you were or the same gal you were before you called upon the name of the Lord. But the Word of God describes a whole new picture of you. The Word of God says you're holy and righteous and pure. you everything acceptable unto God. He's the one now who causes your way to be established and He's the one God who makes you perfect. He calls you to return unto Him so that you'll forever walk in His ways and keep His statutes. He's carved upon your heart and upon your mind His ways, His ordinances. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the name of the living God. Well, today we want you, if you're not sure that you're free, we want to help you understand that you are. Uh, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, he that the Son sets free is absolutely free, really truly free, free beyond all imagine, imaginable freedom. And when you just start thanking God for that, no matter what circumstances dictate to you, no matter what situations try to say about your situation, you just rather instead you believe God's word, you say, Jeremiah said, Lord, heal us and we should be healed. Huh? Save us and we shall be saved. And he said this right in the midst of the Lord really bringing his judgment down. You know, I, I love to look back on the prophecy of Balaam when um, Balak brought him to curse Israel. Israel wasn't obeying God. They were living under the cloud of glory, fire by night, pillar by day, just a bunch of murmuring, complaining, can't get it right, rebellious kids, stiff of neck. Uh, the Lord says, couldn't to look at me, and they're like, stiff of neck. And he said, I should not see or behold sin in Israel, nor regard iniquity among Jacob. His covenant was with them. Isn't that amazing? God's bigger than you think he is. He's more merciful than you've ever imagined. You know, I think about the times, you know, of course his love is here, his peace is here, his joy is here. And I never want to take it for granted. This love, this joy, this peace that I live in right now, there was a time in my life that would have been, I would have not been able to stand in this glory. It would have been overwhelming to me, amazing to me. But when God gives us the capacity, if we're willing to live in it, now that this is normal, this glory that would be <clears throat> to the rest of the world as distinguishable as the noonday sun from a dark overcast night is just normal. But yet, but yet, and I pray it happens this day, there are places where we step into, especially and begin to pray for the sick and the diseased, where I'm so overwhelmed by the love of God. I'm so overwhelmed by his love that every one of my emotions, every one of my thoughts are captivated by his deep affection for all humanity. His love is an amazing, undescribable love. Words cannot reach unto its heights to express it, nor its depths to speak it. It's true. And then I think, ah, I'm just... I'm just discovering, just as it were, the introduction to who you are and your love. It's just like scratching the surface of it. It's just like seeing it from afar off. And yet he's standing there going, I want to fill you with all the fullness of my love. When you encounter this love, I'm going to tell you right now, all the lust of the flesh, all the lust of the eye, all, the, all of the pride of life, all the stuff that goes on in a world that has captivated most people's attention will become totally irrelevant, meaningless. Meaningless. You want the love more than anything else. Men, we were given this. We were born. We were created all about this love. We were, that's what we were created for. We, we were created and purposed in him to walk in holiness and in love all the days of our life. You know, I say it over and again, birds were made to fly, 
Fish were made to swim. Men were made to praise him. But it's a praise. It's a praise that is, that is a product of being captivated by his love. You know, the way that you express love really has to do with the depth by which you've been touched by it. Huh? When you really in love with somebody, there's that special someone that you love more than anyone else. My special someone right now is an organ. She's going to get from me something that not, other, not another human being on the planet is going to get as much as I love my son Joshua and my daughter Elizabeth, my son Cade, my daughter Ruthanna. Where'd she go? And little Ezekiel. I've known Ezekiel for just a few days, and I love him so deeply. He's only been in this world for a few days, and he couldn't be any less my grandchild. You know, can you hear what I'm saying? And I will not be any less than his grandfather. If you could just begin to imagine the love of God, it would redefine everything that you believe about God, and it would also allow you to understand the scriptures. People believe that they can understand the scriptures because they, just like they read a history book. No. God retains all right to revelation. He retains all right to revelation. On the road to Emmaus, you see it happen. You see as Cephas and others were walking on the road to Emmaus, Jesus comes to them and they're taught and he begins to, um, you know, describe and unveil the scriptures to them. And it was a, that moment in time that he calls their, them to have the ability to understand the scripture, to understand the word. It's pretty amazing, huh? It's the resurrection story. The resurrection story is that this is the moment now that all blindness is taken off and the spirit of wisdom and revelation comes. And you can see that with John. I mean, I mean forgive me. Well, John, and there's been examples, but what I wanted to point to is Paul. The Apostle Paul, he's talking to the church at Ephesus. There was no church that greater doctrines of who we are in God and who Christ Jesus is in us was unveiled. But yet, in the midst of all this, and you think about it, because some of it seems paradoxical that, that Paul opens this epistle to the Ephesians and he says to us that you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. And he begins to describe these wonderful things before he gets to verse 19. And then at verse 18 and 19, he says, but, in, but still, in view of all this, I pray that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. He's talking to a Holy Ghost church, powerful Holy Ghost church. The church at Ephesus had people ministering in it, like Paul, like John. Everybody was itinerary, uh, itinerary apostle, evangelist, pastor, teacher out of that church. When Paul writes this epistle to the Ephesians, barring none, there is no epistle that describes salvation in loftier words of splendor and divine expression. None. Spend about 10, 15 years studying the epistles and you'll agree with me. People say, well, I read it once. <laughs> and, I, and this is going to bring me to where I, I want to take you this morning by the Spirit of the Lord. Because, Father, when we preach, it isn't to entertain you. It's not for information only. This is not FYI. This is the living word coming on the inside of you. We worship, just get your heart ready to receive God's word. Just get you in a place of, of, of receptivity, of yieldedness. Because you know what? I'm not a self-made man. I'm a God-made man. And as long as you're going to be a self-made man, you can't be a God-made man. As soon as you're good enough for God's acceptance, for God's holiness, and for God's salvation, you come up some different way. You, you in deception. God takes us in the midst of our uncircumcision and the filth of our sin and iniquity and our inability to do anything that pleases God. And he washes us up and he cleanses us. Huh? He takes us, he finds us in a ditch and a pit, as the prophet said, having been, as it were, aborted, our navel still there with the umbilical cord attached to it. In our blood of birth, he finds us there in that ditch, having been rejected having been abandoned, having been aborted, and he washes us. Huh? And he puts salve and ointment upon our navel. Huh? And he puts upon us all the royal garments and splendor and ornaments of divinity, power, 
True. And we grow before him and we develop before him and he puts upon us a crown of glory. Amazing. Of course, in that description that the prophet gave, Israel and Judah gave him their fist while they said they served him. I'm going to tell you, if you get to walk with God, you've got to learn how to walk in humility and brokenness. I was thinking this morning how that there was this wonderful man of God. In fact, my dad, he was in his 70s, and, and Pops had done a lot in the kingdom of God by the time he was in his 70s. And we were with a lot of other ministers, and many of the ministers, is pretty famous guys, you could say, in the realms of men, they're famous. I'm, you know, heaven, that's another story. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because the last be first there. You know, we don't even understand the threshold of it all fully. But we do know that it's found in lowliness and meekness because you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He's going to exalt you. It's not only now where you want to go now. In the future, it's like, I love to see prophets prophesy. I love to see prophets give prophecies like Jeremiah did. Hanamel is going to come to me and he's going to bring to me an opportunity to purchase his property. And then within the next day, within 24 hours, his cousin comes. You know, that seer ability. God gives that. People just get, you get hungry for the, we try to force things. We try to want, want to be something, you know. Hey, we all get to be sons of God. Isn't that good enough? We all get to have his ministry. Isn't that good enough? People who have a doctrine to follow Jesus but don't believe that they're going to do these works and greater works, they're just completely deceived. Because Jesus has called us to come and imitate him. The word we use to translate follow is to imitate. We imitate him. We walk like he walks. Huh? We move, we speak like he speaks. We believe like he believes. Jesus did this, so I'm going to do this. Jesus reached out his hand like that, I'm going to reach my hand like that. <laughs> You know, I've, I've, got, I've had the privilege of traveling with a lot of ministers, and I really got that. I got that imitate, you know, thing. And, you know, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. He demanded people to imitate him Amen. as he was imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. And so knowing that the Lord has called us to imitate him and that, you know, I, I don't know everything. Does anybody in here know everything? Okay, good. Just check it <laughs> And I see somebody moving and functioning and anointing greater than the anointing that is being able to manifest in my life at this juncture. I realize I got something to learn. Amen. And that I didn't get there by accident. You didn't get here by accident. No. You might have thought you stumbled in this place or you misnavigated <laughs> here. Or somehow you can't get somebody twisted your arm or whatever. But that's not the way it is. God got you here. So he could get something to you. Amen. And um, anybody that thinks that they can learn to walk with God on their own is sadly mistaken. God has created it in a situation to where that we learn everything about him through brokenness and humility, which is going to fundamentally come in the way that you interact with people around you. Everybody's got this mono e mono with God. You know what I'm saying? And it's wonderful to have a personal relationship with the Lord. But he defines that based upon how we love one another. He defines that how we're submitted to him based on how we're submitted to one another. He does. He, this, is how he, this is how he does it. And if you don't want to participate with what God has, you don't understand his realm. His realm is this place of brokenness and humility and servitude. And what a blessing. And that's where all the miracles and signs and wonders, that's where the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that's where all this wonderful glory is discovered. And, I, and today I pray in Jesus' name that you'll grab a hold of, if you just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he's going to exalt you. Here I am. I find myself in the places where I know other ministers would love to be. It's like, how did you get to, how did you get to, to be such close friends with so-and-so or so-and-so? How did you get to travel with them? All I can say is, well, God set it up. I didn't ask. God set it up. So whatever they did, I did it. If they drank something I never drank before, I drank it too. If they ate something, I ate it too. If, if they, if they, if they, Said, bah, 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 bah. I said it too. <laughs> Carla said it, Condia. Yeah. Huh? And I can go through a list of different people, of different expressions that you may be familiar with. And reality of it is, is I got hit with it. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a human 
mimicking. It was a divine imitation. Huh? It was, hallelujah. It's like learning how to move. You can go to the hospital tomorrow with Stuart, and you can, you know, say you're with him and that you're ready to do surgery. And that the hospital needs to go ahead and, and uh, hire you because you'll be the best cardiologist they've ever had. And the next thing they're going to ask you is, can we see your papers? Can we see the certification of, from the American Medical Association? And if you don't have one, they're going to say, call 911. There's a nutcase in the house. Somebody's, you know, there's somebody completely insane. People do that all the time in, in the church. They do all that all the time with God. He loves you. You're special to him, but you're going to learn. You're going to learn. You're going to learn obedience. Christ Jesus learned obedience. You're going to learn how to follow the Holy Ghost. And he's going to use apostles. He is. He's going to use prophets. Amen. And he's going to use evangelists. Hallelujah. It was just so, I was just so blessed to have Debbie here. We've known Debbie for a long time, evangelist Debbie Rich, Rester. We've known her for a long time. We're, we're helping them. We're going to be helping them more with their Bible school that they're starting. And just, you know, have an evangelist gift. You know how many evangelist gifts we've had here this year? You know how many apostolic gifts we've had here this year? We haven't had as many prophet gifts because and there's reason for that i'm not going to get into that because that would that would sidetrack me you know but i'm gonna tell you right now let me just say this father is earnest to raise up in the midst of his church that purity and that accuracy of the prophet jeremiah is a great example of it it's like i can't speak don't send me i want to get married i'm going to serve you i'll be a priest for you but look come on i don't want to wholly give myself over to speaking your word and you see how that work, the dynamics of that work out. Much to say about that gifting. You'll have to come to the School of Spirit to get it. Um, but at any rate. And you say, well, I'm going to study on the Bible. Well, good, sure, you can study the Bible. Fine. And about time, you, about time you die, you will know something that people knew, you know, a thousand years ago. Are you with me? Maybe I could even say 1900 years ago. Why not go ahead and build on the 1900 and go with that, right? Are you with me? There's a foundation. And while all we are is we're building upon that foundation, which is Christ Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are built on it. And all we are is the product of submitting ourselves and humbling ourselves and being led and being guided, not within some fringe doctrines, but within the household of faith. Within the household of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, right in the very center of what God is doing. And, and I'm getting ready to take you over to a verse of scripture here in a minute but that I want to use this morning. But I want you to grab a hold of some things with me in the Holy Ghost so that you can recognize that there's always been this press upon the church from the very beginning. There was the Judaizers who wanted to come along, you know, who were actually converted priests, converted Pharisees, converted Asians, converted Sanhedrin, a various different sects of Judaism who come along and say that they accept Christ Jesus as the Messiah. They accept the working of the power of the Holy Ghost, but then they wanted to integrate Judaism with the new covenant, the old covenant with the new covenant. And even, even Peter was carried about with some of it. Paul had to straighten them out. He said, I rebuked him before everybody. That's pretty radical, isn't it? it is. In Galatians. And then on the other side of the press of the Judaizers trying to take the new covenant and mix it with the old covenant, having types and shadows. And why, why, it's why Paul said, I'm afraid of you guys. <laughs> you, you, you're observing Passover and Feast of Tabernacles and you're observing all these various different feasts of the new moon. I'm afraid of you. You've fallen from grace. You don't realize it's all been fulfilled in Jesus. Amen. You don't realize it was all types and shadows that was telling about a glorious springing forth of the life and power of God in the midst of his people. And, uh, and well, we want to get that happening in the midst of God's view all in another way. We just got to agree with God. That's all we need to do. 
And then on the other side was the Hellenizers. I love to say Hellenizers. I mean, you know, <laughs> Hellenism is a, a sophisticated way of saying Greeks, okay? And Hellenization, though it does ring of hell, <laughs> and it certainly is justifiable that it should ring with hell, is nothing more than being uh, filled with the philosophies of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, on and on, Philo, on and on. Of course, Philo is that, that moment of time where there was a conversion of a bifurcation or a split where all of a sudden Jewish philosophy and Greek philosophy came together in Philo. And so most of what people say is Jewish tradition today is Philoism. It's not Jewish tradition. Oh, well, actually, most of what they say today isn't even Philoism. It's actually, it's actually a form of Romanism. Like the five cups of Passover, it's not Jewish tradition, that's Roman. But I don't want to get into that too much either because there's so much nonsense that goes on. People are just ignorant. True. You need to study a little bit more. You need to research a little bit more. You need to have a little bit more of an understanding. And praise God for the people who, who God has raised up to help us sort those things out because there's always these additions trying to be imposed upon us. And, you know, people come to us and they give us, try to put these additions on us and we think, well, my goodness, they must know what they're talking about. It, we would have been wise if we would have just stuck with the word and just done it like God said to do it instead of just adding these things. And so here are the Hellenizers, these people who are basically espousing so what Socrates taught, what Aristotle taught, really the Gnostic ideology that says, no, 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 no. It's okay to continue in sin. It's okay to have a lifestyle of sin because they're in the midst of that sin and your lifestyle of sin the greatness of God's grace will, will be magnified. And so I'm going to press. Here, here are God's people deciding whether or not they're going to wholly submit themselves to what only the Holy Ghost can do. How many of you understand that when you're born again, you're a newborn babe? Huh? Listen, when you were born into this world, you were born in sin and iniquity. You were born in sin. Because the sin of Adam passed upon you and you were under the stronghold of a demon power in the reign of Satan. Period. Provable. It's provable. It's not some wild-eyed idea. Like some, you know, stories that you hear. Alien space stories. This is provable stuff. Look at humanity and the sin and iniquity. I mean, spend a little time talking with the folks from Overland's Missions here. They'll tell you some pretty crazy stuff about the religious nature of people in Africa and the various different beliefs. All over the world, it's just crazy, wild, demonic stuff. You were born under this reign of sin with a propensity towards sin. And every day shaped in a demonic realm, shaped to be just like Satan, shaped in iniquity. To one day call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and he by miracle comes and he removes by the power and the authority of his name and by this wonderful work of redemption in his blood, every sin, every iniquity, removes it, Amen. removes it. Amen. Without, any, without any works, without any effort, without any right doing on our power, just believing. There's no way for us to get out of our prison. That day, we now are born in righteousness. That day, we're born in righteousness. That day, a new birth. To receive the gift of righteousness. You receive it as a gift. It's a gift. So that you can be taught righteousness. You don't receive it, you know. Come on, people. As a newborn babe, look at it. If you want to get this, look at the allegories that God, that, that God used. Not the allegories that rabbinic tradition uses. Or the allegories that Aristotle used. Look at the allegory that God used. A newborn baby desiring the sincere truth of God's word. The sincere, and it's, it's an add-on word, but it, it kind of helps. Milk of his word so that you may grow thereby, so that you can mature. Look at a baby. What can a baby do? Fledge about and whine. <laughs> uh, 
It's like, <laughs> these aren't really appendages. They're flagellin or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and look at the information that comes out of its mouth. And look at it three years old as it tries to reach for a shiny object and everything on the table is now broken. And everything a child does is wrong. You know what I'm saying? And if parents don't get this early on, they're constantly spanking their kid and hollering at their kid and making them dysfunctional because they don't get it. I started to say stupid. I'm trying to be nicer. <laughs> everything a kid does is wrong. But we love the child. And we're devoted to the child to teach the child, you know, not to burp and do other obnoxious things and to slap other kids and even bite and all the rest of the stuff that goes on, right? And we love them all the way through it. And God loves us all the way through it, far more than we love our children. Father loves us all the way through it. But if we're trying some other means by some other way, I'm going to tell you the fundamental reality of repentance and the doctrine of repentance is conversion. Amen. Without question, the cartilage of reconciliation to be changed. God granted it to anyone who would call upon the name of Jesus say, Help me God, I want out of this mess yes. and I don't know how to get out. Amen. Or if you're like, oh God, I don't know how to get out of this mess. I'm going to do my very best. And when I'm done, I hope that you like it. You're not getting anywhere with God. Lord, I want to get out of this mess. And I'm powerless to do anything for myself. You come to the cross of Christ. That's the place that you come now to solely rely upon his ability to do everything for your life. It would have been impossible for you to do for yourself. Satan imposes upon us a threat continually that God is going to reject us. It's not true. The blood of Jesus Christ is there. You walk in the light as he's in the light. Where does that begin? Walking in the light as he's in the light. The understanding, the revelation that you have that moment when you said, Oh God, change me, save me, forgive me, have mercy upon me. True. I mean, how worthy was Barnabas, son of Timaeus, as he sat by the wayside begging. All he had the insight to do, enough to do, was to cast away his beggar's garment. Because the master called him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. He had half of his theology was somewhat skewed. But he was calling out to the right one. And Father, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, there's this new thing, it's an old thing, where everybody's got to have, you know, the right name. And they don't even pronounce the name properly. You know, it's like people are pronouncing the name of Jesus in Aramaic. Well, if you want to do it right, why don't you pronounce his name in Hebrew? Go all the way. Listen, the, you say the name of Jesus in any language. Amen. Jesus! Jesus! It doesn't matter what language you say his name in. God regards that. He knows who you're talking about. He regards the state of your heart. He does not need a translator. Jesus, who's Jesus? <laughs> I had some Jewish people trying to, trying to tell me the other day about the etymology of Jesus. And they, I let him go on and on, let him go on and on. Just dig themselves into a deeper ditch so that they'll be more humiliated. When you show them the answer. Okay, continue. <laughs> Jesus is simply a transliteration of the Greek lettering for his name. That's all it is. It's just a transliteration. In other words, you took the iota and you put in a J. Huh? Are you with me? Is everybody, you took epsilon and you put in an E. Just a transliteration, not a translation, a transliteration. Lord knows exactly who we're talking about. He knows exactly who we're talking about. And besides that, in 200 B.C., someone said the other day, oh, well, that name was never even, it was invented by Constantine in 300 A.D. How ridiculous. You can go look at the Septuagint in 200 B.C., and it was the Greek translation or equivalent for the name Joshua. Hello. 
or the Hebrew, Yehoshua, not Yeshua, Aramaic, Yehoshua, Hebrew. Huh? Are you with me? The Lord knows who you're talking about. You don't have to, oh, we got to get the name right. And get a position and a posture, and then suddenly a lightning bolt's going to come from heaven, everything's going to happen. Nonsense. You know, that's just men trying to somehow make themselves more acceptable to God. <laughs> it's checking yourself to make sure you're circumcised right. Or whatever. You know, whatever crazy stuff and notions that people come on with. And all the proofs that they're going to bring along with it. They're going to bring it. They're going to bring the proofs. See, God said it right here. Circumcision for an everlasting covenant. Olam. Olam which is translated everlasting, can actually be a substitute word for great-grandpa. Hola. <laughs> Study just a little bit more before you jump to your conclusions and tell God that his word is invalid. Give yourself. I mean, I, I, I'm always saying this to people. And this really brings me to Exodus 29. That's where I want to go. I'm always saying this to people. Give yourself to reading the word of God every day, every morning, every evening. It will change your life. Not some little scriptures that you, you know, hold dear to because you think you understand them. I promise you there's not a verse of scripture in the Bible that I understand the same way now as I did the first day I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And even though I didn't understand as I did now, God regarded it maybe even better and more than he does, does now. Because it was just a simple childlike faith of, oh, save me. Yeah. You need to know the Greek and the Hebrew. <laughs> and as Tim all says, the Aramaic and the Lithuanian. Because <laughs> it's really about as, it makes it matter much as I understand the Lithuanian. But nonetheless, nonetheless, God's word, he watches over his word. I don't care what language you put it in. I had someone, I don't remember where it was, but it was a very rare language. I said, read these passages of scripture to me in your language and translate them for me. And as they were translating, I'm going, wow, that's better than our translation, the King James. Father watches over his word. Don't you slight God and his power. He's bigger than you ever thought he was. He's more powerful than you ever thought he was. He's greater than you ever thought he was. He's more almighty than you ever thought. He's more sovereign than you ever thought. He's the most high. I encourage you to talk to him properly. To change the way that you believe and interact with him. Say almighty, sovereign God, most high. You don't have to say El, El Young. And now he's going to hear. I had to say God, most high. Are you listening to me? Huh? Are you listening? I didn't learn how to speak Hebrew and read Hebrew because I needed to get nearer to God. It wasn't the assignment. It wasn't the assignment. I discovered over and again, I was just there all the time. It was just perfect all the time. God's great big God. If you would just start reading your whole life would be changed. You start at Genesis 1-1, and you read to Revelation 22-21, and I hope you're not bored. And then you go back again, and you read it through again, and I promise you, you will not be bored. It will become more interesting. You go, wow, that, that was, wait, 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 I remember reading that somewhere else, and you can't find it. Start at the beginning, and highlight better next time. And find yourself, because if you just, if you spent 10 to 15 minutes in the morning, and 10 to 15 minutes in the evening, you'd read through the entire Bible in six months. And every, every year you'd be reading through two times, 10 to 15 minutes in the morning, 10 to 15 minutes in the evening. But something is greater is going to be happening. A true worship and devotion is going to be taking place. Something greater is going to be happening, happening than the captivation of your intellectual abilities. To process God's word. If we were saved by our intellectual ability, we'd all be forever lost. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not getting a test on all of various different doctrinal, you know, things in the word of God. 
it's all about it's, it's all about a relationship it's how well you love and how well you love him is displayed by how well you love those around you how well it's about how you serve him and a way that you serve him is described and witnessed to you every day by how you serve every, everybody around you it's not a pop quiz coming out of nowhere you know the instructor's more interested in testing you on what you don't know you, you had, we've had those teachers, right? You're like, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. I know everything you told us to study. I can, stand here, I can stand here and quote it. Ask me anything. And what you did was you tested us on everything that we don't know. Well, I expected you to take what you did know from what I gave you and discover these other things. Oh, great. Huh? The loser, the loser stamp. Now, people, the Father's got this fellowship going on that is expressed, is supposed to be expressed in our conduct, in our character, in our manner, in our expression, and we get all out there on all these things that don't even matter and don't even count. Hello, calm down, man, you're loved. Relax, you've got somebody who's devoted to you. Who is so devoted to you, he took your, your sins in his own body on the tree and bore them away and has, and has dedicated himself in his faithfulness to perfect everything that concerns you, to present you faultless. Wow! Is God a liar? Is he not able to keep up with what he said he would do if you call upon his name? No, he's not a liar. He's, he's the opposite. He's the truth. No, he's not unfaithful. He's faithful. The worst, messed up, most dysfunctional, beat up person on the earth can grow as a newborn babe and be developed. Huh? Huh? You go into some African tribes or some tribes up in Laos. You tell them before they get saved, they got to get clothes on, especially back, you know, a number of years ago. We have friends in, in missions in Kenya. And the way they, you know how they did the follow-up program from the crusade? They just followed the troll clothes home. Because they get everybody all dressed up, and then on the way home, they took all the clothes off. <laughs> so you know where everybody lived. Huh? And the Lord took time. So you heathen, you're not born again. There's a proof. Look at your neck and self. Because people are out there, their culture has imposed so much upon them. Uh, their social structure, their caste systems have imposed such things upon them. God is devoted to growing us and maturing us. I mean, to the place where we are functioning in all of his fullness and all of his glory. Because I don't care where you at, as it were, on the scale. You still are far, far off from what God's purposed you to be. And guess what? He's dedicated to get you there. <laughs> Hello, and it's not some process of sanctification. It's a relationship. It's a development. It's a learning. It's a training to be shaped every day by the Holy Ghost. Can you hear? Yes. Can you get, can I dig yes. deep down in there? Yes, thank you, Lord. Take the knife of circumcision so you can get the foreskin of your hearing properly adjusted. Get the, get the bell off. You're listening to me. God loves you an everlasting love his mercy that is expressed as an attribute of that love we'll sing every morning we'll sing forever of his mercy because it takes forever to express it not because of some religious activity it's like wow i just got another whoa, revelation a download of your mercy oh god you're amazing and he's standing there looking at us with his eyes of affection the Lord's eyes are a flame of fire only for the Hellenizers who are messing with his salvation. His eyes are a flame of fire for the Judaizers who's messing with his salvation and trying to bring a former covenant into a new covenant. The old covenant is dead. It's a Hagar. It's a hag. It's a wench dressed in rags. It's been cut off. She's dead. And that's how, that's how. He said, wow, that's pretty right. No, that's Paul. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, that's Paul. So that you may be married to another. Hallelujah. I'm not impressed with that hag, that wench dressed in rags. 
when people come bring her up and say, this is beautiful. What are you talking about, man? Come to Jesus. And have all your faith and all your confidence in him alone. Now, I've got to try to get to this. Because I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've got to deliver this to you. Exodus chapter 29 I just want you to hear it in light of what I've been, what I've been saying. God loves you. Say, hey, God loves me. God loves me. You know, when I had all the reason to believe that God didn't love me, when I had all the reason to believe that there was, I was not right with God, when I had all the reason Satan could give me a list of objective and provable points of how it was not possible that I was God's favorite child, on the base of his word, I told God and everybody around me, I'm God's favorite child. Huh? And it wasn't for them. It was for me. I would tell everybody around me, and I'd tell God, I'd tell myself, and I'd just announce it. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm the beloved child of God Almighty. I'm the one that he died at Calvary's cross for and was buried, and after three days rose up from the dead who ascended up on high, whose name has been exalted above every power. He did that all for me. I'm the one. Are you listening? Oh, that's false doctrine. No, that's excellent doctrine. And you're invited to come in and have the same opinion about you as well. It's just that I'm going to have it about me. I'm going to believe what God says about me. So many times people take the word of God and they want to try to impose it upon others or give it to other people and they themselves have not yet been a beneficiary of it. It's time to grab it and say it's mine. You don't go through some long process. I've got it today. I had it that moment in time so many, many years ago. As real as I do now. It's just now I love it more than I ever have. It's now I've learned how to walk in a greater consecration, a greater devotion. I've learned how to walk in a greater maturity and insight to not allow things that the enemy would use. People, Satan uses more against you that you can't see. Because of, the, uh, because of the immaturity of your spiritual state than he does of what you can see in many instances. So while one person is yelling at another person about their sin and wrongdoing, hello, there's still a serious beam that have got to be removed. There's a serious beam. Because you wouldn't be condemning. Not on that level. Huh? You'd be delivering. Huh? You'd be getting the moat out. You'd be taking away the sin. You'd be taking away the affliction. You'd be saying, oh, see, there, there, there. See, there's proof. There's proof. That's very demonic. That's exactly what Satan does. Oh, there's proof. See, see. If you were right with God, you wouldn't be. Demonic. It's exactly what Satan does. He's the accuser of the brethren. And anybody who's got a mouth of accusation, don't you categorize them with the Holy Ghost. That is categorically the demonic realm. The comforter has come. The intercessor is here. Father is showing us very clearly, don't do these things. These are wrong. You do these things and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But bigger than that and, and preceding that, he's showing us the way to be right, the way to be empowered, to live right, to walk in holiness. Hallelujah. He's never pointing out the problem and then supplying the solution. He's always first with the solution and then just underscoring the problem. Hallelujah. And then reminding us of the solution. It's real simple the way God talks. He says, I'm the answer. In Exodus chapter 29, and, and uh, verse 31, and I just want to relate this verse of Scripture to the way our, our devotion goes on in the evening and the morning. And it's, listen, people, it's not really a discipline. Can you hear me? It's a passion. Huh? Huh? Would I see my wife when I get, when I get to the ranch tomorrow? I'm going to tell you right, I'm not going to be disciplined to walk up and hug her. <laughs> see what's next. Oh, yeah, kiss. There's a passion, man. There's a passion going to be released in my life. God's not interested in discipline. He's interested in passion. Passion speaks of love and, and, and relationship. 
And he's brought us into a oneness. People, people that don't think that they're one with God, you have not agreed with God, thus you cannot have the miracle of his word. If you try to do it, you're a thief and a robber and you're trying to get up some other way. He's provided the way. And we accept what he's done for us. Today, I want you to accept what he's done for you. I want you to then begin to enjoy how you mature and how you grow and the fellowship of it. Because the Bible, the Word of God is far more than just a book and the stories that you're reading and ideas and concepts that you're putting together. It's spirit and life. It's powerful. It's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder soul from spirit, joint from marrow. It is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. It is the corrector. It is the means by which we're perfected. It's the, it's the eye-opener, the revelation, the insight, the understanding, the knowledge of the Lord. That's what the Holy Ghost ultimately uses to create within us all that Father has demanded. Agreement with the Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, uncle, my uncle Virgil, a great evangelist, pastor, wrote a song one day. He said, I am, said I am, so I am. What a wonderful song, eh? I am, said I am, so I am. The Word of God transforming me. Sons of God to maturity. Isn't that powerful? I am, said I am, so I am. That's the foundation of the church. Hello. Let God be God. Let God do it all for you. Let God create it all for you. He created the grass for you to walk on. Let, huh? You didn't say, oh God, I just can't walk on your grass. It's just not worthy. I created the sun to shine upon you to give you warmth and all the rest of the things that come from the sun shining on you. I'm just not worthy of it. I'm just going to live in the darkness over here. Find me a cave. Go on and on. Whether you're thankful for the foods you eat every day or not doesn't change the fact that he provided it. And he's loving, it, loving you and happy to see you being sustained by it. That if you do not know him, perhaps you'll surrender yourself to him. Or though, and many who say they know him but have never submitted to his power. Many who began even by the miracle power of the Holy Ghost but then try to become made perfect or matured or complete through the works of human ability and primarily trying to go back to the law by the instruction of those who supposedly know, knew Judaizers. Now, we have a movement of it. The Messianic movement has now married and come in league into a greater way with rabbinic tradition. And if, you are, if you're versed in rabbinic tradition, if you know rabbinic tradition, because you studied the Gemara and you studied the Mishnah and you've given yourself to the Talmud, then you can discern, oh, that's rabbinic tradition. But if you haven't, then you're just going to be taken in by it unless you're in a company of people who've devoted themselves to understanding, rightly dividing the word of truth. Light from darkness, good from evil. And that's the good, wonderful thing about the body of Christ and the people who are devoted to the things of the Spirit and watching out over the sheep and watching out over the flock of God as his pastors. That's what a pastor is. It's really a shepherd. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ten in the flock. Goats are difficult. But God's got a privilege. God has a wonderful miracle thing for goats. He's got a way of taking goats and making them sheep. <laughs> Unfortunately, goats don't want to be sheep many times. And they're always bucking you. Buck, buck, buck. Huh? One day I saw my dad. My dad is a big old guy. Six four, big old guy. And he was raised on a farm, and we went out to, I don't remember what I was doing. We were doing some horses or something. I don't remember. But uh, this old goat, Billy Goat, came trying to get close to my mom. So my dad, knowing better, I don't know what he was thinking at the time. I, I guess there's really nothing available for him or whatever. He grabs the Billy Goat by the horns. When you do that, I'm going to tell you right now, the, the duel is on. It's not like the really is going to submit to you. Oh, no, you got me by the horns. Now I give up. Now he's like, all right. This is what I was looking for. And he went after him. I mean, he's about to take my dad down. I saw from way off. I knew exactly what to do. Grab a stick. You run towards a billy goat with a stick. 
You don't come. Now, nice little gentleman. But please behave. Because the billy goat is going to butt you. But with a stick, the billy goat is gone. He knows the stick. It has been ministered to him once or twice already. <laughs> that is all you can do with a billy goat. Just hit him with a stick. I didn't feel the love of God. Well, become a sheep. And you will. You will feel the love. Sheep are so easy to tend in that, in that sense. They're just... We're the sheep of his pasture. To be a lamb, a lamb, to be a lamb, to be a... To understand these agrarian terms are hard and difficult for people. But the Lord tells us in so many different ways about our response to him that we should be able to get it if we're not... If we don't understand what it means to raise sheep and what little lambs are like. I mean, I'm telling you, there's no resistance there. They're the sweetest little things. Huh? It's just beautiful. And the Lord comes to us as his lamb. And here in the sacrificial system, in the evening and the morning, the Lord has put together something that is, that is an everlasting covenant of the evening and the morning sacrifice. And he says, now this is that, he says, seven days thou shalt make it, well, verse 38. Now this is that which you should offer upon the altar, two lambs, the first year day, the first year, day by day, continually. Say day by day. It's a fellowship. It's a worship. This is really the first definition of worship. It really is. The first definition of worship is found in the book of Leviticus. And I know I've, for some of you, I've already gone over time. I'm in overtime, but get excited. It's just like, you know, it's like the playoffs, okay? <laughs> a, person, a person told me one time, he said, well, we would come to your church if it didn't last for four hours. So after a while, you know, I said, okay, Lord, I got all these people telling me that the church meeting didn't last for four hours, that they would come. Sounds like the church is going to be huge if I can cut this thing back. So I cut it back to like two hours. Same amount of people came. So it's like, I'm going back to four hours. I'm back to four hours. And I said, I got a liberty. The Lord said, I was thought the Lord said, well, let's just see. Let's just see. <laughs> When the Lord says in what we call the book of Leviticus, in the Hebrew language, it's Vayekra. And Vayekra means literally, and he called. Kara is called Vayekra. It means, and he called. And so most, most books of the Bible in the Hebrew language is based on the first word. And there's a whole history behind that, which I won't go into. But then he called, and he's saying there in Leviticus 1, verse 1, He's describing to us what worship is. And he called and he says, Karev, or come and come, come as near to me or get as close to me as you possibly can get by bringing an offering and come and stand here at the door. And there's so much typology there because the door is Christ Jesus. At this place called this, ta this tabernacle, this place that the Lord sanctified for man to be able to meet with him. And this is this worship wasn't defined by a guitar and singing or a lyre and singing or a harp and singing. It was bringing this offering. It was this fellowship. It was this intimacy that was going on, represented by a lamb, the one who ultimately, John said, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, always interacting with God on the basis of his salvation to where that we say, he is the Lord, my righteousness. So that's what Jeremiah said, in the midst of all of the condemnation of Israel. You're going into destruction. You're being wiped off the face of God's provision for you and your prosperity because of your sin and your iniquity and your, your refusal to obey. But you shall return for I shall bring you back and you shall say in that day, you shall call me by my name, the Lord my righteousness. And I'm in that day. I can take to you the Old Testament and show you many verses of Scripture that talks to us about the Messianic age. I'm in the Messianic age. I'm in the Christ age. I'm in the time and the reign of Christ Jesus. He began to reign 2,000 years ago, and so are you, and we want you to get in, and we want you to make all those verses of Scripture, not just Joel, it shall come to pass with God after that, those days. I will, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's all like verses of Scripture that describe to us who we are. And until you agree with it, if you say, here's who God said we're supposed to be, and you start looking at yourself and you disqualify yourself, there's no way for you to move forward with God. You have to look at what 
the Lord said you are and say, that's who I am. Lord, save us and we shall be saved. And you said you saved us, so thus we are saved. Lord, heal me and I shall be healed. And you've healed me, therefore I am healed. Not, oh God, save us and we shall be saved. And when is it going to happen? Because how is that faith in what Jesus did at Calvary? How is that faith in the resurrection? How is that faith in this wonderful, great salvation provided for us through Christ Jesus? It's not faith. And, and, and so here we see this devotion, this worship, and this fellowship that's being described in the evening and the morning sacrifice. And the Lord says in verse 42, this shall be done continually, a burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle, the congregation. That's how, once again, it's linked to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, when he, uh, suddenly the cry comes forth, the viacra comes forth. He says, where I will meet with you and speak with you. See, I, there's a fellowship, you see where I come and camp around him every day at the door of Christ Jesus by the means of what Christ Jesus has provided for me in him, that now I get to meet with him. I get to fellowship with him because he then says, he says, and there will I meet with you. He says, and the tabernacle, and that's who you are, the temple, shall be sanctified by my presence. See that? By my glory. And if you don't have that going on, I don't care what happened to you last year, last week, last month. I don't care what happened to you 10 years ago. We're taught Father's not asking us about a singular event that took place at some time. He's asking about what happened today. What's going on right now? How do you feel about me right now? Is there a divine interaction going on or is it purely intellectual? I'm so excited about the Lord. I'm so excited about God. I'm ecstatic. It's amazing what he did for me. That's pretty intellectual. There's not a lot of emotion there. There's not a lot of passion. Maybe some discipline. Can't believe it. I'm overwhelmed. Those folks are hard for pastors like me to deal with. It's like, hello. Is there a soul there? Is there a spirit there? Is this a zombie or is this a living? <laughs> quickly, I'm, if I could do anything quickly, that's just like a, supposed to be medicine. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. I'm gonna be real brief with this. I'll take it up tonight. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. I did a translation of this this morning, and um, I might just read it to you just so that. I was thinking this yesterday as, as I was talking to Evangelist Pat Schatz line. And begin to describe how the Lord showed him the great altar call of heaven. It's beautiful. As the angels appeared to the shepherds, keeping the flock. And as they pronounced, good news. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. This day in the city of David is born Christ the Savior. Come worship the Lord. The altar call. And hear it. In many respects, it's very different from the way that we have religionized Jesus in an invitation with God. We've got to move from the culture of condemnation to the fellowship of righteousness. We've got to understand 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we no longer live under, under a, a covenant of condemnation, but this is the ministry today of righteousness. You are the righteousness of God. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, from the natural perspective, most of those guys would have been unqualified or what Paul says or uses in this verse of Scripture and, and transla is translated reprobate or worthless. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, are you listening to me? Examine yourself. Are you living the life of faith? Uh, listen to me. Come on, man. Faith is described by Jesus Christ. Faith is described in what he's done for us, not what we've done for him. 
We can never do anything for him until we embrace what he has done for us. We can never have anything that is worthy of acceptance by God until we receive that which he supplies to us to offer to him. We can never know him until we receive the knowledge. We can never love him until we're filled by the Holy Ghost with his love. Can you hear? Examine yourself. Are you living the life of faith? Or once again, are you back over in that same state that he says to the church at Galatia when he says, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by your human ability and by your human discipline and by your observance of the old covenant that had this dead? He does. Are you listening to me? Yeah, there's no question about it. There's no question about it. He's constantly re re repeating that thing because he goes, he, he'll migrate from what he says there in verse uh, if it's Galatians 3.3 3, to what he's going to say in Galatians 4.16 when he says and he begins to talk about the allegory of Jerusalem and of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Hagar and Sarah, Isaac and Ishmael. Nobody could preach that sermon better than the Apostle Paul. I hope that you hear it. I hope you'll respond to God. He loves you so much. Nobody loves you like he loves you. You can hear that over and over again. And say, well, that sounds, that sounds really sweet and everything. But the day you call upon his name, you will begin to step into a realm of relationship where you are loved like no one's ever loved you. If that has not happened to you, I, I question whether or not you've ever really called upon the name of the Lord. And having received that love and received that mercy, you know, because you begin to give that love and you begin to give that mercy. And when somebody's just hard and, and just overanalyzing you and always putting all this stuff on you, I'm telling you, it's something different than what he supplied to us. Examine yourself. See, are you really living by the faith? Are you really living in the faith? The faith being that which Jesus did for us and brought forth the new creation, the new man, the divine nature, born again. He says, let there be a proof. And there's a list of those. We don't live after the flesh. You know, Romans 8, 9, 9. People just, it just blows me away. When, when you read that verse of scripture, but we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And then people look around going, well, wait a minute. And then accept it. That which is a flesh is flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Will you accept this unspeakable gift that God has supplied and call it done? And say, I am said I am, so I am. No matter what, it settles every argument. I am said I am, so I am. Shut up. And especially to yourself. Are you not convinced? Are you yet? Are you still not convinced that Jesus Christ lives in you, that you are the tabernacle of God, the temple, the place where he dwells. Are you trying to earn it? Are you trying to be qualified by some other means than this free gift? That's the dividing line. That's the haves and the have-nots. The haves are those who said, he did it all for me. Instantaneously, he took this defiled place of idolatry. He purified it and cleansed it and sanctified it and made me his temple, his holy dwelling place. So that everything that you read about in the Old Testament about the temple is being realized in our life right now. That's the value of the Old Testament. It describes to us who we are in the new. When it's centered around where God dwells and the fellowship that we're allowed to have with Him. Prove it! And that so much is proven by the confession of our mouth. For with our confession, <laughs> with the confession of our mouth, it is made unto salvation. We believe in our heart unto righteousness. You're listening to me. Huh? And then I, I love the rest of that because the Lord says, the rest of that passage and that paracope, when he talks, when, when God describes from the Old Testament, oh, how beautiful are the feet on, on the mountains that bring good news. 
How shall they hear? How shall they know or hear unless there be a preacher? They want to take their Bible, go off by themselves in a little closet. And well, maybe if you're out in the jungle somewhere in the far flung reaches of the Congo or some other remote place, that might work. But right here, I'm going to go in a closet and I'm going to figure it all out for myself. How should they hear unless there be a preacher? How should they now understand what God has for them unless there be a preacher? And how shall there be a preacher unless he be sent? How can there be a preacher unless it is a special working of divine grace that has given them the ability to unveil, to speak and declare the things which God has spoken? Amen. You listen to me, yes. every one of you. Yeah. Everything you believe is based upon something that someone told you. I don't care what you say. You hear me? Yeah. You are a product of your civilization, of your culture, of the people group that you are surrounded by, of the influences that you have listened to. You've not discovered anything on your own. The challenge is, are you right or are you wrong? The divided line is the word of God. It's the plumb line. Christ Jesus, his life. See, it's not some details of semantics. It's the very model and description of his life. It's looking at Jesus and being conformed to Christ Jesus. Not some, not some little split hair details. Not some feast of the new moon. Not whether or not you kept Shabbos properly. Huh? Not, not whether or not you keep the Sabbath. I live in the Sabbath. Some Jews, some Haredi, basically trying to persuade a Jewish girl to go back to Judaism trying to show how wrong Christianity was because they worshiped on Nimrod Day, Sunday. And I helped them understand, or did my very best, to recognize, wait a minute, it's not Sunday in that sense. This is S-O-N Day in the fact that this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. You just all lost in your semantics. You're, split, you're splitting hairs based upon Things that have nothing to do with that which the Holy Ghost is speaking. We live in Sabbath. We live in the rest. Jesus, He is the rest. We're keeping it. We're keeping, the, we're keeping this every day. We assemble, it's good to assemble ourselves every day together. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do every day. Huh? The disciples of the early church made no distinction between any day other than they did highlight Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection. That was the only day they distinguished in the New Testament. So you can go back to the Old Testament for your information if you want. Try to drag it over here in the, in the New Testament. But we're going to say, that's a rat. Get it out of here. Did you hear me? Should I go through that again? Did I, did I offend anybody? Let me try this one more time. You come dragging that thing in here, and we're going to say, foul, get that stinky thing out of here. You're bringing a type and a shadow that we're living in. We the temple. We the tabernacle. God's come. He set up the holies of holies here. I don't need to go back to some temple. I am, I am the temple. Say, I am the temple. I am the temple. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord hit it over and again, didn't he? We the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to convince yourself of that. That's the proofs. You need to be convinced. And really, that's what he's, that's the exclamation mark here. He's really, he's like, when he says, let there, let there be a proof, he's saying, be convinced, be persuaded, see the proof, see the evidence. Are you not convinced that Jesus Christ is either in you or are you unqualified? I pray in the name of Jesus Christ right now that everybody sitting in this place will erase the chalkboard of what you believe. And let it be engraved by the Spirit of the Lord Amen. upon your heart. Amen. Let it be Lord. something that yes. you can live yes. and that is seen in your conduct and your behavior and your manner. Because the Lord, I'm going to tell you something bigger. He said there's supposed to be a river coming out of you of the life and expressions of God, which is fundamentally highlighted by joy and love and peace and, and, and submission and obedience and humility and brokenness, hallelujah, and teachability. I was going to, I'm going to finish that story I left off. I'm, the, I'm one of the world's famous leaving the stories <laughs> my wife tells me all the time you know how many stories you left I, I told. 
my dad, 70 years old. A lot of famous preachers around in this particular meeting that we were in. He's in a back room. And my dad is beginning to express some things out of the realm of, and, and he knows the word of God. You know my dad, he knows the word of God. He's been used by the Lord in radical ways. In a household of, of people who are well trained in the word of God for generations. And there he's talking about his need to learn. His teachability underscored to everybody on that room that no very few people there understood a single word he was saying. You know why? Because they couldn't relate to still being teachable at that age. They couldn't relate to the idea and concept of that I may know him. They couldn't relate to the concept of, he was actually talking about all the things that he had learned that God had taught him through my life. And I didn't want to say that, you know, because I don't want to be in any self-serving way. I wanted to try to keep it more abstract, but just to make it pointed, very pointed. He's talking about the things that God had taught him in, in, in the period of time that I've been his pastor, because that was quite a transition where my dad was my pastor for many years, and then I became his pastor. And he's sitting in the room talking about how all these things he's learned from the Lord. The teachability is one of those expressions that you know him. Hey? That humility, that brokenness, that always hungry to recognize, wait a minute, the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, to recognize that, wait a minute, this is a, this is a depth that has no bottom, it's a height that has no top. And where am I at in that? I'm invited to come in to know the love of Christ and confess his knowledge, to be filled with all of his fullness. Wait a minute, where, where would I even have a a means by which to connect with such an, a concept that I could be filled with all of his fullness. Maybe if you don't really fully appreciate what that is, maybe you could ex just take that. But to recognize, wait, 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 wait a minute. Those things I was reading today, which are nothing but scriptures joined together about who he is. And that's just a fraction of them. I'm building this, I'm building this. declaration of worship about who God says he is. That's who God says he is. That's not who somebody else said he was. It's who God says he is. And there is no, there is no valid past tense really in future tense there. It is. Huh? It's where the past tense and the future tense becomes the present tense. It's a very interesting little thing. And it's always there in the past and it's always there in the future and it's, it is. And he's unchanging. Nothing about him's changed. He's an amazing God. He's an amazing God. Examine yourself. Are you living your life by the faith? The new covenant. The new, examine yourself. Are you living your life by the faith? Prove it. Be convinced. Does Christ Jesus come into you? How did you get it? If you've earned it, you'll never give him praise. But when you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it. I deserve it less than I did the day that I received it. Can I say that again? I deserve what he did for me less today than the day that I received it. And I love him more today than I did when I began. Can you hear? It's not a paradox. Huh? It's just growth and wisdom and revelation and knowledge of who he is and what he's done. Everybody just stand with me. We pray today that everything about your life has been changed. I remember the day that Crystal walked into the house. She was dressed in black leather. She was depressed, tormented, afflicted, medicated. And then I find any possibility of moving forward. Death was written over her, a death sentence from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Behold what Christ Jesus did. Hey. Hallelujah. I mean, I, he did, I just love it. I, I love turning and looking at Crystal up at the keyboards. And, and you as well, many of you that came to 
that I watch the transformation of your life. There is no proofs in substance that can compare, not historical, not scientific, than the testimony of your own life. Nothing. Somebody said, can you, can you refer me to some literature? Can you refer me to some sources to be able to convince others of the reality of God? Yes, I can. You. I refer you to you. Because if you can't be your reference point, just shut up. You're just going to do damage. If you can't be proof enough, if your testimony isn't powerful enough, then just wait. It's greater than any book ever written, any scientific data ever uh, assembled. What God did for you. What He did for you. What, he do, what He's done for you. And what you can be convinced of that He will continue to do. And having begun here, I'm telling you right now, I look unto the author and finisher of my faith. I'm going to tell you right now. Having begun a good work in you, he shall complete the job. He, I promise you. Just don't look to yourself. I, it's so easy. You get in a situation, you get frustrated, you get overwhelmed. It doesn't seem like that you have the goods. It doesn't seem like it's working out like, like the scripture de described. Just stand still. Behold the salvation of your God who changes not, who dwells in the light, who's unchanging, immutable, who dwells in light which no man can see nor has seen, which no man can approach unto, but now is fully realized in the person Jesus Christ who lives in you. And it's not a paradox. It's just the reality of God's unspeakable gift. Amen. If there's anybody here today, whether you're standing in this place with us, you're watching on the web or by YouTube, and you've never turned your life over to this love. God, He is the essence of it. He's the inventor of it. He loves us with an everlasting love, unchanging love. If you want to step into something that is literally the whole purpose of your existence and being. God has made a way that anyone, no matter what level of intelligence, literacy, where they come from, what culture they've been imprisoned by, simply by calling upon this name that is so powerful. I stood one day trying to get into North Korea. As a North Korean man stood before me. It is God seated my heart for North Korea that day like never before. I had already been seated by God for North Korea. But as I stood there and, and the people that were with me and missionaries in northern China to North Korea said they beheld something that they had never witnessed, a North Korean receiving a pass to come across to, to China near Yanji to buy medication for his family. And as he was standing there telling me about Kim sung il because they worship Kim sung il it's a, it, it is a... It is a governmental religious cult they did now they have a different interaction with his son another story but he's standing there telling me about Kim sung -il. I said to my translator I said translate exactly what I'm going to say word for word I said do you know Jesus and I'm telling you before I really even got Jesus out I was just telling him do you know the power and the presence of God had already captivated him he begins to weep and sob just sob probably in his 60s. You know how hard it is to reach a person in their 60s, right? They become so locked in to their pride of life and what they believe and what they figured out. He begins to sob. And as I continued on to say, do you know how much the Lord Jesus Christ, do you know, first of all, I said, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? And I begin to describe how that Christ Jesus died for his sins, how he's come to reveal himself right now to him. We watch the I watch the total transformation in this life. I watch the powerful name, the name that is above every name, the power that created all things. Nothing that is seen or that was made came into existence except for he spoke it in. That same spoken living word of God came and has, has now revealed God's love to us. And that name and the power that is in that name and the authority that was in, revealed in that word is all contained within that name. 
so that you call upon the name of Jesus Christ. No matter who you are, where you are, or what you've been through. The same event that happened. The guy tries to give me the money. He, this is how faith worked. The money he was bringing to, for his family. Because I said, this day, I told him, this day salvation has come to you and to your house. And I, and I included healing, everything. And he tried to take the money that he, had came, that he had come to China to buy medication for his family and give it to me. Because he said he didn't need to buy the medication anymore. Just a whole package instead of like, you know, three-minute sermon. It's like Pentecost, you know. I'm going, oh, God, I didn't know it could happen this way, you know, today. It's like going back to Cornelius' house. They got the whole package in a three-minute sermon. It wasn't all these other ideologies and all these other concepts and all this other backslidden stuff to have to work through. Just an acceptance of the day. No matter where you stand, no matter where you cheated on God, backslidden, whether you've walked with God faithfully or whether you've not known Him at all today, there's no name as powerful as that name. And if you call upon that name, the power of that name will be revealed in your mind. God will change everything about you. All you have to do is respond to Him with your hearts. It's not some magical words that you have to say in Hebrew. <laughs> or Greek better fit for the Lord chose to make the new covenant uh, be revealed in the Greek language. Hello. Did you know that? God chose the Greek language to reveal the new covenant. So reality of it is if you're really in the new covenant, you better learn how to speak Greek. <laughs> no. It just... This stuff that's going on, this nonsense, this heresy that is going on that sweeps people into deception and takes away from what Jesus did alone by himself for anyone who will believe. Call upon his name and rely solely on what he alone, he alone can do. Amen. Amen. Say Jesus, Jesus. plus, plus. Nothing. nothing. Equals, equals truth. truth. <laughs> Add anything, it's a false equation. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, for those, that was especially for all of you who have to understand everything in terms of math. No. <laughs> Jesus. Katara moshite akane me echesi. Echepora. And then I'm going to say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Because he's here for you. That's how Paul preached. Paul didn't pre Look how Paul preached in Ephesians chapter 19. The guy he preached. He walks up to the disciples, Jewish disciples. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Isn't that beautiful? It's a pointed, important issue where people want to have Jesus without the Holy Ghost. You can't have Jesus without the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is one who brings them. And Holy Ghost is not different than he was in Acts chapter 2. And anybody who says he is, that's philosophy and ideology. It's man-made. It's lies. God the Holy Ghost came like Joel said he would come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Peter testified concerning what Joel's witness was true. And they were experienced. Papa wants that for you. And is that something that bothers you? We want to cast that out of you right now. If receiving the Holy Ghost is bothersome to you, you need deliverance. Huh? <laughs> Holy Spirit, the things that the Holy Ghost should be something you hunger for. Amen. Amen. Anybody here today, you need help? The helper's here. Anybody here today, you have sin in your life? I have the cure. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you and wash you. Anybody listening to me right now on the web? You got sin in your life? I have the cure to cleanse you right now. Where there be no more sin, he'll remove it as far from the east as from the west. If he would have said as far as the east from the north, they might converge at some point. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> probably not, but who knows? You could probably come up with some theory. But east from west? No way. Today. Would you put your trust in Jesus? If you will, you'll have no more sin. You'll have no more sin. If you say have, you have no sin, then your sin remains. But if you come to him and say, wash me, cleanse me, oh, he'll take away the sin. Then in him you can say, I have no sin. 
in him. Amen. Huh? Is this, is this something you want? God will do this for you. Are you sick? Are you diseased? He's the healer. All you have to do is just call upon his name. He'll heal you. He'll touch you. Change your life forever. He'll fill you with his presence so that out of your, out of your character and demeanor and emotion and passion, God's love, his glory, his goodness, his mercy, his truth will be explosive like rivers. Hallelujah. My wife and I were standing in front of the uh, Victoria Falls during May. Of course, it's, you, know, you guys know how it is. I said to my, I said to, we were standing there with Phil and Sharon. I said to my wife, I said, see that? That's what I look like in the Holy Ghost right now. <laughs> so that's what the Holy Ghost looks like following out of me. Look at that. Isn't it amazing to be able to kind of see an expression? And actually, it's bigger than that. I want you to see it. I want you to believe it. I want you to say it. I want you to make what God's word says that which you believe about you. Amen. That's being conformed to him. That's agreeing with him. That's the proof. Are you not yet convinced that God Almighty lives on the inside of you? Are you not yet convinced? Amen. Are you, do you need to be convinced? God wants to convince you. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait just a few more seconds, maybe minutes. I want to convince you. A miracle change now is present for you at this moment. There is nothing greater, no greater healing than spiritual healing. No greater miracle than the miracle of salvation. No greater cure than what God brings when He changes your heart and gives you a new heart. He takes away a stony heart that is stubborn, can't receive. John says, I'm going to work with this a little bit. John said, those who hear us, hear God. Those who do not hear us, do not hear God. And all I'm doing is declaring what John said. So thus I could say, those who hear us, hear God. And those who do not hear us, do not hear God. And herein we know those that are of the spirit of truth and those that are of the spirit of a lie. Pretty radical what he said, isn't it? Come on, people. Is that so hard? Don't be stubborn. Don't be stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Don't walk around in a place where you think that you know something. For none of us know anything as we ought. God the Holy Ghost is the teacher. And the teachable spirit is what God wants to give you when he gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. 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 Hey, listen, let the work be done. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't been baptized, we just had a baptism last Sunday. I think it was, or Sunday before last. But then we want to baptize you in water because we want it to be sealed in your life. We want everything about what God has done to be sealed in your life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, we want it to happen. We want it to be sealed in your life so there'd be no more doubt, no more question, no more wavering. Huh? If you have an off day or a bad day or just run to Jesus. Run to the author and finish your good faith. Settle it. Let the glorious anointing of the Holy Ghost come into your life. How many times do you reckon the Lord will forgive you? In a day. 490 times. Are you that messed up? <laughs> Are you listening to me? And really, seven times 70 is a Hebrew idiom that means as many times as you want. So you could say 4,490 times. But if you want to just keep it purely on the level of multiplication, 400, 490 times, he's there interceding. He's not there saying, saying, see, see, look at you. That's not the trying and proof of God. The trying of proof of God where he comes and tries us as silver and tries us as gold isn't to prove us wrong. It's to make us in every way right. It's to purify the dross if there be any. If you cannot come to Jesus today and simply receive what he has for you by calling upon his name by the simple utterance of Lord Jesus, come save me, then there is no hope for you and there is no hope for me and there is no hope for anyone else. Go sacrifice your goats upon your altars. Go sacrifice your bulls. Huh? And bring your speckled birds. 
and find out that God ain't accepting that if, that if need be. No. No, listen. I mean, I know the Holy Ghost is dealing with some people's hearts in here. On, and online. I just want you to understand. My Jewish friends that are watching me right now. Yeah, I said that against you. And having anything mixed with Jesus. Because if there's any, if it's Jesus plus something, you, you have fallen from grace. Paul made it very clear. If you just need circumcision, you have fallen from grace and made Jesus of none effect in your life. Listen to me. Once again, God loves you. But it's his way. It's his way. What will you do with Jesus? Everybody should be excited about that. Like, wow, you know, just a gift? Like a present? Like, this is mine? Whoa, you might stand and go, well, this was too much. This was too much. <laughs> well, all the Lord's going to say is, oh, no, I just wanted to get that for you. Go ahead, it's yours. Take it. Get, open this thing up. Let's get on with the program. Try it out. Try it out. Here, let me show you how it works. I just want you to soak in this for a little bit. I know some of you are in a hurry to do something, but this is better than that hurry. Soak in it. He's going to show you. God the Holy Ghost is going to show you how it all works. My son was up on the backhoe with me the other night. And it was like late at night. It was in dark. And I'm just like, and I, I mean, I can make the thing work. And he's just standing there looking. I said, yeah. I said, you just got to feel it. You can sit down here. When you serve her, start. It's like, you're not feeling it. Boom's going everywhere. Nothing's working. You try to get dirt. Nothing's coming in there. And it just, you know, and, it's, and everything just kind of perfectly obeys. Here's God, the Holy Ghost. He's just standing watching every move. And I explain to him how to do it and how it works. And another thing is you sit down in a chair and, and it's like, oh, it was so simple. Because I can, I can dig probably... 100 feet plus, I'm digging probably 150 feet in an hour. Most people can dig, dig a foot. All the, well, he, he would be able to dig a foot in an hour. Are you with me? Just us with the things of the Spirit. The Lord says, no, 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 come here. Let me show you how it works. And we sit down in the chair. We go, and it's like, nothing's working. He said, no, 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 let me show you. You know, 30 years later, no, no, come on, let me show you. <laughs> He's so patient. He's so patient. Why don't you just start rejoicing in him? Start looking at you. Start looking at him. Can I get everybody in this place from the least to the greatest? To start looking at him. Can you get you? If your view is bad, it's you. But if your view is like, whoa, this is the best view ever. You're looking at Jesus. If you're qualified, you're looking at Jesus. Huh? Huh? If you're acceptable, you're looking at Jesus. You mighty women of God. You mighty women of faith. Hallelujah. I'm so excited about what God's going to do through Claire and Zoe. He's going to shake the nations through these two girls. I'm so excited about it. Such an anointing in God the Holy Ghost. Well, amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I, I take it that everybody in here is righteous and holy, fully qualified, on your way to heaven, named written in the Lamb's Book of Life, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Everything's good and getting better. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So that from here on out, when people ask you how you do it, you can say better than good. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, amen. Everybody, come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. That's, what, that's the, hooking up with a, a miracle. God will multiply the things that, that he's given you. and He'll prosper you, bless you. Amen. Supply all that you have need of according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus.
Hallelujah. Yes, physically, materially, spiritually, in every way. Find a bunch of people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them, bless them in the name of Jesus. If there's anybody that needs prayer for anything, we're here to pray with you and for you. We know that God who has promised will also supply it. Hallelujah. And then we'll be back here tonight at 6 o'clock. People gather around 5 for prayer. So make sure that you jump in, get all him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Make sure you jump in and get all of him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jump in. Get all of him. Hallelujah. <laughs> jump in. Get all of him. Hallelujah. Thank you, my God. Hallelujah. Woo <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. 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 Hallelujah.